It is uh, my pleasure to, to introduce uh, my, old, my former uh, PhD supervisor, uh, a professor at the London School of Economics. He's been teaching there for 30 plus years. He's written uh, nearly two dozen books on international relations uh, uh, security studies. And today, uh, he's going to be discussing, uh, is Russia on a collision course uh, with the West? Uh, I have an obligation to let all of you know that this is being live streamed, I believe, on the World Wide Web. So if you have a problem with that, now's your chance to get out of here. If not, be prepared to be surveilled. Uh, and with that, I'll hand it over to you, Christopher. Uh, good morning, and thank you very much for the invitation to uh, uh, share some thoughts um, about the situation, uh, increasingly dangerous situation between the West and Russia. So I'll speak for about 30 minutes, and then uh, we can open it up to any questions that you have. Uh, my old uh, friend and colleague, Michael Burley, has just written a book on the history of the present called uh, It's Best of Times and Worst of Times. Uh, and he asks himself a question at the beginning of that book, how do we write a history of now uh, with any uh, hope of accuracy? And he says there are only two, really, ways in which we can do this. We can use historical analogies, um, or we can try to find and uncover the historical underpinnings of what's happening. I'm going to try to do the second, but let's just stop for one second and talk about historical analogies. Uh, because people say we're in a new Cold War. Uh, others use a different uh, term. They say Cold Peace. Uh, Lucas Kello uh, at Oxford has uh, coined a, a term which I quite like called Unpeace, uh, a new era in history which is neither war nor peace, uh, in which essentially we're perpetually in conflict with each other uh, for the foreseeable future. Arne Westat, my old colleague from the London School of Economics, his new book uh, on the Cold War, uh, actually says the Cold War never came to an end. And basically, we hit the pause button uh, after 1989, um, and now we're fast-forwarding. I don't intend to talk about historical analogies. I intend to try to look at some historical explanations for what's happening. Uh, and first of all, uh, let's talk about a deteriorating relationship and why it has been deteriorating since 2007. What's the important thing about 2007? That was the year that Vladimir Putin went to the Munich Security Conference uh, and basically said, our attempt to be nice to you has come to an end. We're now going to fight our own corner. And that's basically what he's been doing. So to what extent are we responsible for this? Uh, deteriorating situation, and there's no doubt at all that we are partly responsible for it because we didn't do consequence management. We didn't even do strategy. It's very interesting that Obama, uh, back in 2012, said at a press conference, we don't have a strategy on Syria. And he was amazed about the furore which uh, immediately broke out. So he came back a week later and said, oh, we've now got a, a game plan. A game plan is not a strategy. And Hillary Clinton, in her memoirs, criticized her boss by saying he didn't have a strategy. He had a motto, don't do stupid stuff. What you need is more than that. So what did she do when she was on the campaign trail for the presidency? She came up with 84 different slogans, and she found one, stronger together, which didn't help. And Zbigniew Brzezinski, one of the only two people who certainly did strategy, and thought strategically, who died a few months ago. The very last uh, blog for, uh, item that he had before he died was that make America great again uh, is a bumper sticker, not a strategy. So we've all of us, I think, uh, must be held responsible for, partly responsible for what has been happening. And I remember the National Security Council, our very first report in the George Bush administration, uh, shortly before 9-11, when everything became terrorism, the very first report was on Russia. And it said that we don't need to take Russia into account for the next 15 years because it's not globalizing. And indeed, Sergei Lavrov famously said at a press conference a few years ago, we're a minority stakeholder in globalization. You do globalization, we don't. 
which I think is an interesting uh, insight. And then NATO enlargement, which is probably a disaster uh, waiting to happen. Uh, and, of course, ingratitude. I'm afraid the Bush administration was not very grateful for the help it received from anyone, including poor old Tony Blair, uh, who got very little back. Macron has discovered this as well. You're nice to the president. He gives you absolutely nothing back. Uh, basic. I was accused by Patrick of anti-Americanism yesterday. Well, I will say that Americans are usually not very grateful for what they receive. You know, they're the demandeur in history. They m set the terms. You know, and the British were like that uh, back in 1900. So it's hardly surprising. So anyway, we didn't do consequence management. There was a, a course at the London Business School just before the financial crisis. The case study was the Royal Bank of Scotland. And the Royal Bank of Scotland was supposed to be the great success story. That's my bank. It almost went bust overnight. It was saved on Sunday afternoon by the Chancellor of the Exchequer, so I could actually use an ATM machine on Monday morning. I didn't know this, of course, at the time. The course was called The Strategy of Not Having a Strategy. That's why RBS was so successful and made so much money and almost went bankrupt as a result. So you may have seen Vladislav uh, Sukhov's uh, uh, piece a couple of weeks ago, A Hundred Years of Solitude. Did you see that? We Russians are now going to be the bachelors, he used that term, the bachelors of the international system, unmarried to anyone, no partners. We're going to just be alone for the next hundred years because you, the West, have rejected us. Uh, Sukhov is the thinker in the Putin circle in the same way that uh, Suslov used to be in the, the Brezhnev years, the ideologue. So that's what we're talking about, 100 years of solitude. And that's not a Latin American novel. <laughs> it's uh, a realization. Uh, so that's the first thing. Uh, however, read a book by the former American ambassador to Russia, Michael McFall, which is very, very revealing. He was responsible partly for the reset button when Hillary Clinton said we have to reset our relations with Russia, try to make them friends. He said there was no response by the Russians. They simply were not interested in the reset button. He also makes a very interesting insight. Yes, sure, Putin likes having Trump in the White House for whatever reason, but he's done nothing. He hasn't exploited that to actually improve relations with the West. Why, McFall asks, it's because he needs the West as an enemy, uh, essentially. Uh, it's the legitimating principle for his regime. And I no longer talk about Russia and Russian foreign policy. I talk about the Putin regime's foreign policy, because Russia is now a one-man show, uh, essentially. And we have to ask ourselves why the Russians find this collision course in their interests, or why Putin finds it in their interests. And that's what I'm here to do today. Uh, second thing, the contempt for the West is extraordinary. You didn't find this in the Soviet era, partly because I think the communists were amazed that the West was doing quite so well, uh, but partly because for ideological reasons, you know, the internal contradictions of, the, of Western civilization, it would collapse anyway. But Marx, you know, had been a Westerner. So there wasn't this contempt that we see now. Um, what's it all about? Well, the Guardian correspondent in Moscow, who'd been there for about seven or eight years, uh, he left uh, last month, and he uh, came to say goodbye to all his friends that he'd made during his time there, including one, he said, very high-level official, who he didn't name, who said uh, to him, well, you think we're barbarians, don't you? You always have thought of Russians as barbarians. And, of course, he said, no, 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 Dostoevsky, Tolstoy, we love you. Where would we be without the Russian novel? And he said, no, no, don't think you can fool me. You think we're barbarians, and we are going to be the barbarians you think we are. We're going to act barbarously. And what you've seen is extraordinarily barbarous behavior by this administration, shameless behavior. So whether it's the famous phone call with Angela Merkel, there are no Russian soldiers in Crimea. Nothing's happening in Ukraine despite the fact that the largest artillery barrages in European history since 1945 have been in Ukraine, the largest tank battles have been in Ukraine, you read nothing about this in the newspapers in the West. This is a full-scale military operation and occupation of a country. But we're, we're not doing it. 
lying to somebody and uh, finding the whole thing amusing. Of course you don't believe a word I have to say, but I can lie to you. The Salisbury attack, 15 different explanations for why uh, uh, the Scripple uh, family was hit by nerve gas. The Russian ambassador, a complete fool and an oaf in London, uh, likes chuckling in his uh, uh, interviews that he gives. He laughs out loud at his own jokes. Uh, his explanation for what happened was it was the mother-in-law, or the potential mother-in-law. She didn't want her son to marry the daughter of a traitor. Great. Um, that's a good explanation as any. Uh, Brexit. You know, it was the British government wanted to divert attention from the uh, failure of negotiations. It was a suicide bid. That's a fascinating one as well, a suicide bid. Just like the uh, Ukrainian, uh, the MH17, the Malaysian airliner, which went down, the brazen lies at the press conference. Uh, forget the Dutch investigation and all of that. It was a hoax. It never happened. There was a bomb on board. Ukrainian nationalists of whatever kind. This lying is fascinating. And it's cultural. It's not ideological. And we go back to Zirkov's article, I think, which is basically you come from a dying and decadent part of the world. You're on your way out of history, and uh, that's good. Because for a hundred years we tried to join you. That's what he says in his article. For a hundred years we tried to become Western, and you rejected us. And now we're going to sulk for a hundred years. You now that's collision course, I'm not absolutely sure. Um, here I come to the kernel of what I want to say today, because in his article said, he said, of course we're not Western, and we're not Eastern, we're a half-breed country. That's the term he used, we're a half-breed country, we're half and half. We are a unique civilization. We span two continents, and we have two mentalities. Sometimes in the morning we think Western, sometimes in the evening we think Asian. What is all of this? So what uh, Vladimir Putin said at the Valdai Conference in 2013 and has been saying ever since, we are a civilizational state. We're not a nation state, but a civilizational state. And that, I think, explains the reason why we are on a collision course with Russia. Uh, what is a civilizational state? I'll give you a wonderful insight. Uh, a couple of months ago, uh, Russian geneticists discovered that the children of... Uh, people who'd been in Leningrad during the famous siege between 1941 and 44, 900,000 people died, biggest and bloodiest siege in history, had passed on a unique gene to their children. Yes, in one generation you can have uh, genetic uh, change. And that gene slowed the metabolism and allowed it cells in the body to be more energy efficient. And they also made you super patriotic. And surprisingly, uh, or you won't be surprised, uh, Putin has this gene. The head of the Russian Foreign Intelligence Service has this gene. Uh, Putin's chief of staff has this gene as well. So they are, if you've read your Machiavelli and you, you know the importance of virtu, they are virtuous, unlike every other Russian. So vote for them. Make sure you make your vote count. And that is why the Levada Center last year discovered 34% of Russians think Putin is the greatest man who's ever lived. 38% of Russians think Stalin is the greatest man who ever lived. Had this uh, poll been taken during the Soviet Union, of course Lenin would have come at the top. You know that there was a, a theory of Soviet science in the early 1920s that you could actually reanimate people and bring them back to life. You could have a second coming but not of Jesus, of course, Lenin in this case. That's why they tried to cryogenize his body, but the refrigeration system didn't work, so they had to go for embalming. But there he is, still there. The Russian church won't allow his body to be taken out of the mausoleum because the Russian church is now in bed with Putin, of course, and the patriarch said recently to take Lenin's body out of that tomb and bury it would be an act of de-Russification. But then, of course, the patriarch says that Putin is a miracle from God, and we should all love him for that reason. You know that KGB seamstresses made special suits for Lenin's body because they changed the suits every week 
For years they did this. <laughs> it is quite amazing. You couldn't make it up. Anyway, I couldn't make it up. I don't have the uh, imagination. <laughs> Uh, what are we talking about, Russia as a civilizational state? We're talking, first of all, about some 19th century concepts which were introduced into Russian thinking by the intelligentsia. Who are the intelligentsia? Novelists, largely. Today, they're academics. And I'll get to that in a moment. Um, who crafted a story about what made Russia unique and special. I usually don't like the word unique. <coughs> it's uh, much overused. There was a famous English tenor, counter-tenor, called Alfred Deller, in a high squeaky voice singing Elizabethan madrigals, going around Germany in the 1950s to the concert halls. Uh, a person of suspicion to the Germans who were not used to the countertenor tradition. And he was in his dressing room one day. Someone knocked on the door and came in and looked at him very suspiciously and said, you're a eunuch, yes? And he said, in England, my dear fellow, we pronounce the word unique. <laughs> anyway. Uh, the Russian soul, right? How many countries in the world claim they have a soul? Only one, uh, Russia. The Russian soul. Um, it's a 19th century invention. Leo Greenfield has written a book about this. It was an invention of novelists who were fed up with the Westerners patronizing Russia and saying, you've disappointed us. You're a failed social experiment. We thought Peter the Great was onto something. Look, look at you now. The Russian soul. Well, Nikolai Berdyaev, who was a, a philosopher chucked out of the Soviet Union by Lenin, uh, talked about the metaphysical hysteria of the Russian soul. You're always invoking it. I remember my very first visit to post-Soviet uh, Russia in 1993. We had uh, the Russian prime minister came along to address us. And uh, he got very angry with some Western journalists and said, you're so materialistic. You know, all you're interested in the West is money, money, money. We have a soul unlike you. So I went off with Je uh, uh, Walden, George Walden, who was an MP at the time, when it had been a minister in Mrs. Thatcher's government, to find the Russian soul. It was just around the corner in a village, a small town called Galitsyno. It was the most miserable place I had seen. Both of us had seen. We couldn't find the Russian soul that day, but undoubtedly it exists. Bedayev said that the church, the Orthodox Church, had been responsible f largely for this nonsense of the Russian soul by saying that freedom, the only true freedom, can be found in Christ. And everything else is mundane. Democracy is mundane. Voting is mundane. It's not metaphysical. But if you're at one with Christ, you have the true freedom. And of course, that means the next world, not this, basically, unless you happen to be have the good fortune of the second coming. So that's number one. Russia's going back to this concept. The second is Russian messianism. The idea that the Russians have a role in the world. Not everybody knows quite what that role is, but it's important. i just give you a quote. It's a quotation from uh, the first Russian philosopher, Pyotr Jadayev, at the beginning of the 19th century in his first philosophical letter. We, Russians, are one of those nations which do not appear to be part of the human race. We exist in order to teach some great lesson to the world. Surely the lesson we're destined to teach will not be wasted, but who knows when we shall rejoin the rest of mankind and how much misery we must suffer before accomplishing our destiny. Now, there's some very interesting tropes, misery, unhappiness. Great uh, Russian author Solzhenitsyn said the reason why the West could never produce a novelist as great as Dostoevsky was that the West had not known enough suffering. You can only be a great novelist if you've suffered and your country has suffered because you can't imagine suffering. You have to experience it. I would suggest that that's not our understanding of a greatness of a writer. You can imagine everything. You don't necessarily have to have experienced it. Uh, Medvedev, at the time of sanctions in uh, Crimea, 2014, said to a Western journalist, your sanctions won't work because we suffer, and we can suffer much more than any of you can. Our people are willing to suffer to fulfill their destiny. Now, the interesting thing about the Jadayev quote is that it appears, I didn't come across it by reading Jadayev, I came across it by reading Brzezinski's memoirs, which he wrote shortly after being National Security Advisor, he used that sentence at the end of his memoirs to say this was also the United States 
manifest destiny, its greatness in the world, suffering, Vietnam, everything else. But he also said at the end, of course, the importance and the greatness of a politician is to reduce the suffering as much as possible. There we are. Solzhenitsyn was visited by Putin and given a prize the year before he died. Solzhenitsyn, of course, died believing that the Ukraine was part of Russia, that Kazakhstan was part of Russia, and that Russia should go back to greater Russia, whatever the pain and suffering that might be required to get the empire back. He talked about the national essence of Russia. Ukraine was part of our national essence, because it's in the Chronicle of Nesta, 900 years ago, he said. It tells you everything you need to know. So if you're, if you're invoking something that 900 years ago, well, there you are. Uh, there's another continuity in all of this, I think, and it's the fact that Russia is a very weak state. Uh, when we think of a strong state, we think of a state that's powerful enough to devolve power to various authorities, to have the rule of law, to hold itself accountable to the rule of law. That's what Pericles said in his great funeral oration. We submit ourselves to our own laws. And that's a wonderful story to tell yourself. It was a story the Greeks were telling themselves because it wasn't entirely true. But it's a story that we have been telling ourselves for 2,000 years. We submit ourselves to our own laws. Whether it's historically accurate or not doesn't matter. Geoffrey Hoskin, who's a great British historian on Russia, says Russia has been the weakest state in the modern system because no government has felt secure enough to devolve power. So whether you're a czar, whether you're a communist, a commissar, or whether you're a Putinite, and that remains the case, the case. Everyone has to find power brokers who will protect them against everyone else. And the power brokers can be businessmen and oligarchs. They're now bishops uh, in the church. They're politicians, of course. Everyone is striking local deals with everybody else. And if you want to see a contemporary uh, example of that, have a look at the film Leviathan that came out a couple of years ago. It's a depressing picture of the Russian state in which everyone is doing deals, including in this case with the church. Uh, there's another resentment, or what I would say, using a Nietzschean term, resentiment, which is quite different really from resentment, uh, of being rejected by the West. And it goes back 200 years. It was uh, the great uh, Montesquieu who said that Russia was a disappointment. He called it a land of absence. Because everything the West Europeans were looking for was absent in Russia. This rejection is very much Zirkov's point that he was making in his article. And it makes you angry. And this is what we're seeing, Russian anger at the West. Um, a few more uh, points. Um, let me introduce you to a guy called Ivan Ilyin, who you may not have heard of. <coughs> Putin has been mentioning him in his speeches since 2005. They reinterred him. They dug up his body and put it back in his. He went for the reinterment ceremony. The Patriarch uh, presided over it because the Russian church loves Ilion. Uh, in 2014, the beginning of the breakup with the West over Crimea, Medvedev sent a copy of his book called Our Tasks to Every Single Russian Civil Servant. And they've been going around the universities telling young people, read Ilion because he's got us in one. And what does Ilion say? He says many things. But this is one, that the world is a dark place of evil. It is illuminated by the innocence of Russia. That the Russian people have shown the rest of the world the light, but the rest of the world hasn't followed them. Uh, Ilian said that uh, Russia was a homosexual country. <laughs> the sexualization of politics is fascinating in Putin's Russia. Of course, Putin says we're not a homosexual country. If we have homosexuals, that's, they come from the West. He told Angela Merkel that uh, e the EU was gaytopia. And it's not a term of approbation, I can assure you. So this uh, is fascinating, the sexualization of politics. People have had anti-gay fits before. My own country had one in the last few months of the First World War. But this is quite different. It's about the decadence of the West. 
The West has no values. Or it has values, but it's no, willing, it's no longer willing to defend them, to stand up for them. Medvedev made a speech once, and he said to a Western audience, we are your only hope. Without us, there would be no Western civilization at all. This is when they were still talking about joining Western civilization. Now, of course, that debate is over. So if you actually think that you are an innocent country in a world of darkness, that is going to color your foreign policy. And what's all this got to do with security, you might say? Well, it's got a lot, because if you look at the National Security Doctrine of 2009, you will find some interesting phrases in that document. Page one, spiritual security. The Russian armed forces exist with the spiritual security of Russian civilization. Correcting historical mistakes, like poor old Khrushchev giving Crimea to Ukraine. That's a huge historical mistake. That's been corrected. There are many other historical mistakes to be corrected, like the Baltic states, for example. They must come back at some point. The Ukraine, they're correcting that mistake at the moment, even as we speak. The cultural unity of the Russian people, extremely important. And that means the diaspora. So if there is, Putin himself said, look, the Chinese are all in China. Everyone in Europe's in the EU, except Britain. It's about to leave, but that's OK. We, 30% of the Russian people, live outside the borders of the Russian Federation. We owe them. We need to secure them. They carry our civilization with them. So it doesn't actually mean that you have to occupy the Baltic states, but it does mean that you will always take an interest in the fate of the Russian people. Uh, a few last uh, points. I would love to mention Alexander Dugin because he's such a... Have you come across Alexander Dugin? Yes. He used to be a kind of uh, guitar strumming beatnik in his early days. But then he started lecturing on geopolitics at the Russian Defense Academy. Uh, and of course, he writes lots of uh, books which are totally unreadable. Uh, Western cosmopolitanism, he says, <clears throat> um, is a threat to Russian identity. Uh, the real word for cosmopolitanism, he says, <coughs> excuse me, is Americanism, Atlanticism, postmodernism, globalization, liberalism, industrialism. He calls for a redrawing of the anthropological map and Civilization is at the key to all of this. So what do they teach students uh, in Russian universities these days? Because as I said, the intelligentsia are no longer the novelists. It's the professors, people in my profession. Um, they teach them about passionarity. Have you heard the term passionarity? It was coined in the 1930s by Agna Akhmatova's estranged son. And it's been taken up in the speeches uh, of Putin. It means that you draw a kind of biochemical energy from the land you occupy, in this case Eurasia, because, of course, if Russia is a civilizational state, it's neither European nor Asian, it's Eurasian, and Eurasia is the key to all of this. Um, there's a new scientific term, it's called topogenesis, uh, and that you can study now in Russian universities. And what's the important thing about Eurasia? Genes, of course. And where did the genes come from? The Tatars, 300 years of Tatar occupation, which has made Russia strong. And that's why Russia's not European. The genes from the Tatars. Uh, it's an extraordinary story, but there you are. Um, last uh, point that I want to make. Um, I've mentioned uh, one other thing. Ah, yes, uh, history. You have to rewrite the history textbooks. Uh, and since 2013, that's what the Minister for Culture, Vladimir Medinsky, has been doing. He's a very honest man. He believes in fake history and fake news. The Russians practically invented it. It wasn't Donald Trump. Uh, and he said at a press conference a few years ago, um, there is no such thing as the truth, and there is no such thing as a fact. Um, facts exist only in the context of a concept. Everything begins with interpretations, not with facts. You could have been quoting Nietzsche, actually, but he wasn't uh, on this occasion. There are no facts. <laughs>
just interpretations. And if you were a loyal Russian citizen, he went on to add, you will never defame uh, your country, and you will show it in a positive light. Uh, historical forgetfulness is at the key of the Putin regime. The Russian people must be uh, forced to forget the bad things in Russian history. When uh, Anne Applebaum wrote her book on the Gulag, kind of update of Solzhenitsyn's Gulag archipelago, she went round every single Gulag site in the old Soviet Union. There's nothing left. It's all gone. Uh, there was one Gulag, Perm 37, I think, or Perm 34, which had been rebuilt with American money to get the Russians to remember the Gulag experience. But most Russians have never heard of the Gulag. They've never heard of Stalin's terror. They don't know about the forced starvation in the Ukraine. You can't read any of this in your history textbooks because it doesn't appear. Historical forgetfulness. So let me conclude uh, by saying that I'm afraid the relationship with Russia is going to continue to deteriorate because Russia is in a state of war, it sees itself in a state of war with the outside world, is kind of almost on a war footing now. Uh, the war will take the place of constant cyber attacks, uh, constant lies, uh, trolling, social media. 10,000 social media sites have appeared in the United States in the last year against fracking. They come from the Russians because the Russians don't want the United States to be an energy exporter, as it became last year, the biggest uh, energy producer on the planet now. That will continue. Uh, the undermining of elections, the support for populists uh, like Marine Le Pen parties will continue. This, I'm afraid, it, we are at war with Russia. It is a different kind of war. For them, it's a fight for the survival of a regime against what they see as Western attempts to destabilize it. Um, so is there any hope? Well, there's not much, uh, I'm afraid to say. Uh, and I'm going to end with a observation by uh, Masha Gessen, who produced a book last year about Russia, in which she said, Russia is a society that cannot analyze itself, can't put itself on the couch, because all the instruments that we use for self-diagnosis, anthropology, history, sociology, philosophy, were hollowed out during the Soviet era. And we no longer, Russia no longer has the intellectual resources to interrogate itself. And the next generation of young Russians are being taught by professors who know very little about the subjects that they aspire to teach. And that is why I am pessimistic. Uh, but I've reached the stage of life where that is almost a kind of default mode for me to be pessimistic. As George Orwell famously said, you know, when all the other isms have been discredited from liberalism to communism, pessimism would still reign supreme. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, Christopher, thank you very much uh, for that very stimulating discussion. Uh, before we open this up to uh, to questions from the audience, and, and when we do that, I guess we've got a microphone in the back that uh, will soon be in the front. And uh, please wait for the microphone uh, when you uh, ask your questions. I'm going to abuse my, my chair position and ask you uh, a couple of questions, uh, if I may. And the first is, if the Soviet Union was in the business of exporting the idea of Soviet man to the rest of the world. Uh, what is at the core of, of the Putin regime's project, if anything, in terms of uh, this conversation with the West? Uh, that's the first question. And the second one is, uh, you've talked about the rise of uh, Russia as a civilizational state. Uh, and the, the, the focus of this discussion today has been uh, on Russia's collision course with the West, uh, which leads me to to think about uh, a rather old and controversial thesis of uh, Samuel Huntington and the clash of civilizations. And in the context of, uh, of your thoughts on this, I'm, I'm wondering if, if uh, 
if you've been thinking about Huntington in this context, uh, and if that's uh, what your thoughts are on this. So, yeah. thank you. Yes, well, I think that's, well, the big difference between ideology and culture is that culture is usually not for export. The ideology is precisely for export. Uh, so obviously the Soviet Union was putting forward a model uh, and trying to create an example that would inspire other people to copy what they were trying to achieve. It's very interesting. Uh, if you look at the, uh, the Prague Spring, which we've been remembering this year, 1968, uh, it was called Socialism with a Human Face. If you look at Xi Jinping's uh, 19, uh, Congress, uh, 19th Congress speech last year, it's a communism with Chinese characteristics. Uh, China is also a civilizational state, by the way. Uh, these are the two major countries that are now saying we're not nation states, we're something more than a nation state. Civilizational states, we have certain privileges that go with that uh, status. Uh, so I think it's uh, a little depressing in that sense that there's why behave well when you don't need to. If you're not going to export the model, if no one's going to be inspired to copy you, you can behave badly, as badly as you actually like. Everything is for internal consumption. It's not for external consumption. There's no outside audience out there that you have to appeal to and be all things to. It's just your own population, which is important. So. Um, the second question you raised about Huntington is, is interesting. I think Huntington was uh, right for the wrong reasons. It's not civilizations that are clashing. It's civilizational states that are clashing and states that are using the language of civilization as a currency of politics in order to make the claims that they want to make. So uh, Huntington, Yes, as a renewed uh, lease of life, but you have to kind of rewrite the thesis in order to uh, push ahead with the idea. All right, uh, with that, yes. Um. <clears throat> Uh, thank you very much for uh, a very uh, inspiring presentation, I think I should call it. Um, especially uh, perhaps all your uh, very illuminating quotes. Um, you said at uh, in the final stages of your presentation that uh, there wasn't much hope. And that actually begs the question, you know, do you see any positive signals whatsoever for the future concerning Russia and its relations to the West? Thanks. Uh, well, the, the, the simple, the short question is no, I can't see uh, anything, quite frankly. Um, and I say that because it's not in Putin's interest to have better relations with the West. Uh, clearly, he needs the West as the, uh, the enemy, the eternal enemy, the eternal other, we might call it that. Uh, constitutive of Russia's identity, as far as he's concerned, is the fact the West is a historic enemy, a historic enemy. He talks, uh, when he looks at Europe, he talks about three Europes. He talks about the Russian world, which includes, of course, the diaspora. So wherever you have a, a large diaspora, you're part of a Russian world. Russia will take an interest in you and will have a kind of droit de seigneur right. You can exercise, if you remember, droit de seigneur and the barons. Uh, exercising that right. Um, then he talks about the historic West. The historic West are the NATO powers before enlargement. Before enlargement. Western Europe, uh, essentially. With whom he said, we can have a perfectly agreeable relationship as we did in the 19th century. And then there is the gray zone in between, which is where the game is being played countries that can be reclaimed by Russia, countries that the West now claims but may lose. A gray zone country is Hungary. I think uh, Putin was very touched that when he visited Orban in Budapest uh, a year ago, uh, Orban said at the uh, speech at the airport, welcome home. And he wasn't referring to the communist era in uh, Russian, uh, sorry, in uh, Hungarian uh, history. He was talking about the historic uh, Russia, uh, for whom the Hungarians had always had some admiration in terms of Russian culture, etc. So that is the gray zone. 
And basically, he's saying to us, if you butt out of our country, if you don't talk about values, if you're not interested in orange revolutions, and you, you're not interested in what we do to protesters on the streets, and you're certainly not interested in gay rights or things like that, we can have a very good relationship with you. But you have to allow us to have half of the Ukraine. You have to allow us uh, to have Crimea. We're not giving that up. Uh, and we will do deals with each other on this kind of 19th century concert of Europe basis. We can divide the map up, like the percentage agreement that uh, Churchill and Stalin arrived at. You know, Greece is 90% yours, Romanians 90% mine. It's a wonderful relationship. We can go back to that. So do we go back to Yalta is the big question that's often set. Does he want to do the reset button for the Yalta uh, agreement? Uh, I'm not sure it's Yalta. I think he's actually more ambitious than that. But it's a desperate uh, attempt to play the role of a great power. But Russia is not a great power. It is the 15th largest economy in the world. Uh, it's smaller than Spain. This is amazing. And when they look to China, they see a country that in 1972, in real terms, in today's dollar values, had the GNP of the District of Columbia today. So they know, they know they're not going anywhere. China's going somewhere. The West is still, still in the business because it's still wealthy, not perhaps as wealthy as it used to be. Russia's a kind of subprime power that is spending too much on defense, 230% increase in defense spending in the last 10 years, which it can't afford any more than the Soviet Union could afford this vast defense expenditure. And of course, at the end of the day, you say, why, why? It's status anxiety. That's basically what it's about, status anxiety. We can't be a great society because we don't have enough confidence in ourselves to be a great society, but we can be a great power. And you have great power with hard power, none of this soft power nonsense that the West talks about. You know, that's decadence, hard power. But then again, you know, it's, 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 it's understandable. There, there's a w wonderful Russian proverb. If you're not sitting at the top table, you'll find yourself on the menu sooner or later. <laughs> Uh, there was a question uh, in, in the back, the gentleman uh, in the back corner. Yeah, my name is Jon Farset. I just have a question. You talked about the lack of a strategy. So, do you have any idea what should be a strategy for the coming time, at least? What do you, would you suggest? Well, history is all about timing. And we've missed the time. Uh, I think 10 years ago, we might have been able to have reached a, a, a pragmatic and acceptable uh, relationship with Russia. Um, but we missed that opportunity. I don't really see strategically where we're placed today, other than to be defensive. So uh, the Putin policy is uh, intimidation. So don't allow yourself to be intimidated is the first strategy we have to have. So don't create weaknesses or vulnerabilities that can be exploited, because he will exploit them. And they're very good at finding those vulnerabilities. We're also very good at identifying them publicly. Uh, so that's the first thing. We're back to deterrence, uh, basically. We're back to the Cold War order of deterrence without the detente element. And that's the worrying thing, and that is why people say that the relationship with Russia is much more dangerous than it was with the Soviet Union for a whole series of reasons. But one of the reasons is detente. All we've got is punishment. And basically, this is what we've been doing. We've been punishing Putin for the last few years as our strategy. Um, the punishment has been very effective in the last few months uh, with the latest round of American sanctions, which have targeted businessmen and wiped $40 billion off their portfolio. This has hurt Putin because he relies on those businessmen as part of his clientship network. Uh, Trump vetoed the second round of sanctions that they wanted to impose last month, which would have been even more hurtful. Uh, we found his weak spot. Uh, he himself, of course, is supposed to be the third or fourth richest man in the world now, according to Forbes magazine. He stashed billions away, mostly in Swiss bank accounts. We can target him personally. He is now vulnerable. We can freeze some of his assets. Uh, but will that push him over the edge? 
That's the big question. We don't want to get into the situation where we push him into a corner, because we know what happens when animals are in a corner, they fight back. So I think the strategy is go, go back to the Cold War. Uh, effectively, that's where we are, and hope that at some point, uh, perhaps because of economic weakness, um, he'll come back into the game and start talking to us rather than trying to undermine us the whole time. Of course, I have to say in his defense that the, the picture I have presented to you today, he wouldn't recognize. He would say that the West is the irresponsible country. The West is the country, is the country that goes around doing regime change and nation building and invading others and creating a complete mess around the world. He would say that we are the ones who involve ourselves in his elections. We're responsible for those demonstrators on the streets, middle class demonstrators, the ones he's really frightened of in 2011. Hillary Clinton was the bad person because she was trying to do regime change in Russia. That's what he genuinely believes, which is why they invested so much money in preventing her from becoming president. So it's a kind of mirror image. And to a certain extent, uh, it's not entirely untrue. That's the problem. <laughs> And you can see the Russian point of view in all of this. But we've got to a stage now where I'm afraid rationality just simply doesn't count. The stakes are just too great. He's invested now in having the West as a perpetual enemy. And this is what McFall, the American ambassador, was saying. He's not interested in a better relationship now. He doesn't want to pay the cost in terms of sanctions. But he's just not interested. The West has to be the enemy now. And there has to be an enemy uh, for him. So I think it's too late now. Uh, even if we came with a begging bowl, I don't think he would be very interested in talking to us. There was a question uh, with this gentleman. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Ola Tunander from uh, Emeritus at Prio, uh, at Peace Research Institute. And uh, you were, seems to be pretty convinced that these events in recent years, that Russia has been involved, uh, directly involved in this, in the Salisbury and all these kind of things. And I was thinking, in, uh, in the 1980s in Sweden, we were pretty convinced that it was Soviet submarines running around all the time, and then it turned out that it was British-American activities. And, uh, and in, we had an uh, investigation in 1983 said that you know, it was clearly Soviet activities and so on. And then in 95, the new investigation said that we don't know really what it was. And we have no proof, actually, for what it was. And 2001, we came to the conclusion that it was one couldn't exclude uh, Western activity, actually. And, and, uh, and then I had a talk with a, with a British submarine captain who said that, uh, yes, we did these operations in Swedish waters and so on with special forces. And, and, uh, and I asked why it couldn't be declassified now. And he said that it might be a new Cold War and then they might be useful again. So it, it's a, it is a, and this is you know, 30 years ago or something. So it, you don't know really what happens always in the intelligence game. And uh, sometimes it might be that it was not the Russians, so to speak. Thank you. No, uh, well, look, uh, 14 people have died in Britain, uh, 14 Russian businessmen uh, in the past 10 years, uh, most of them from natural causes. It wasn't Putin's assassination, but we're pretty convinced that there were one or two other assassinations going on. The Polonium, you remember the Polonium scandal a couple of years ago, which was actually traced the trail all the way back to Heathrow Airport and back to Moscow. We know who did it. He's now in the Duma. He is a politician uh, who Putin calls a patriot. Uh, the Polonium one is incontrovertible. The Salisbury one uh, is, why did so many countries decide that there was enough evidence uh, to have a pretty united front on that one? But at the end of the day, you know, we go back to juries. I've been on jury service. I've done it twice. Uh, you have two councils. You have prosecution council and defense council. They're telling juries stories. You very rarely know, unless the person has admitted to it and pleaded guilty, and you've got the CCTV footage showing him breaking into the room, you very rarely know that the person you're sending down 
uh, to prison because you found the guy guilty, is actually guilty. The whole jury system is built on reasonable conclusions uh, on the basis of the evidence, but not 100% certainty. And that's international politics as well. Your, your case of the submarines, probably well taken. I don't know about that personally. I remember reading about it at the time, trying to get these submarines to surface, etc. Didn't you have one in Norway as well? You had, I think, at, at some point. So, uh, sure. Uh, most of the international community now believes that the Malaysian airline was actually brought down uh, by uh, uh, separatists. Uh, uh, nearly, m practically the whole international community believes the Salisbury attack was Russian. W it's a nerve gas which only the Russians have. We know pr where they make it, and we know that they occasionally use it against their own citizens. Uh, the gentleman in the green. <clears throat> uh, my name is Lou Cotney. I'm an American over here in Norway for my young children who are why I'm here. Um, after researching you, Christopher, I came expecting a uh, an British anti-Russian propagandist dealing in Orwellian doublethink, and you have not disappointed. I'd like to make uh, a couple of points. Uh, the Cocktail Massacre was my glasnost issue, and the Russians, in good faith, finally told the truth, and uh, the Soviet regime fell. They wanted to join the West, and then we forced uh, the Kosovo War <clears throat> on Yugoslavia with Appendix B of the Rambouillet Treaty, which I helped whistleblow, and Yeltsin turned Russia back over to its national security community in the person of Putin. And since then, the West has done things to make things worse. The Holocaust in uh, Iraq, Libya, and uh, Syria, which Britain has supported, and most dangerously, of course, our coup in Kiev in February 2014, which broke our Budapest non-intervention peace treaty with the Russians and was a de facto declaration of war. Now, a couple of, Britain has, uh, Prime Minister May and Defense Secretary Falconer were talking about a first strike a few months ago, which the Russians uh, laughed at. But this Skripal's incident, there are about seven reasons that it was obviously British EZ nerve agent. It was a false flag operation to get countries on side in preparation for the Duma chemical attack. My question is, um, with Britain spearheading all this anti-Russian stuff uh, and uh, instigating wars in Libya, et cetera, haven't you British become the West's North Koreans? <laughs> Enjoy this one. Yes, and uh, well, we'll have a, a, a wonderful meeting between uh, the terrorist Theresa May and President Trump in July when he comes to London. So it would be a meeting like the meeting between Trump and Kim, but even of more historic significance and get an even better claim to having the Nobel Peace Prize than he will in just meeting Kim. You, you, you presented us with an alternative history which is fine. I don't buy into it for one second. Uh, this gentleman uh, right here. And then. Thank you. You mentioned that uh, many of the uh, less glorious sites of uh, the Soviet period had been wiped out, including uh, the going away also of the last camps, the one that was rebuilt with American assistance and so on. On the other hand, uh, not so long ago, I think a couple of years ago, there was a museum, a state museum, not the Sakharov Institute, something like that. It was a state museum actually, open, a very fine museum uh, to the victims, dedicated to the victims or to the Moscow terror. And there's also very recently, there's a big monument actually outside the uh, former Yukos building on uh, one of the main streets in Moscow. In addition to that, you have the serialization of Rizhny um, Sudba and the Kolimsky Raskasi and things like that. So I think the picture is um, a bit more uh, nuanced than that uh, you suggested. To me, it seems like, you know, they, they have done things that means that they can say that, yes, we have represented our entire history, but many aspects of the history, the less glorious ones, they are being blurred and they are not being made important, but they're still there. So they can say to the critics uh, that we have, you know, a full rendering of our history. What do you think about that? Look, I, 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 first of all, I'm not entirely against a historical forgetfulness. David Reif, uh, Susan Sontag's son, wrote a book about the need to forget sometimes so that you can move on. I don't want to use that terrible word, closure. 
that Tony Blair liked to use so much in his speeches, you know, we need closure. Let's close the Iraq issue and let's move on. You have to remember things. But there, there comes a time for selective uh, memories, in a way, positive memories, memories that give you some hope in the future, that allow you to move on rather than constantly drag you back to the past and tie you down there. So yes, uh, the point is that the, for the Russians, the great patriotic war is the one redeeming feature of the entire Soviet experience. It is uh, considered by Russians in opinion polls to be the greatest event in Russian history, 900 years of history, the patriotic war. Um, and Stalin is therefore always number one. When you look at the 10 top Russians, he's now number one. Peter the Great's number three or number four. Putin's number two. Uh, Stalin is the man who saved the Soviet Union. He was also the man who practically lost the Soviet Union through his uh, questionable diplomacy, uh, et cetera, et cetera, and his ridiculous uh, military decisions in the early months of the Great Patriotic War. They don't read about that either. So yes, I can see this need for glorification. You only have to be in Russia at the time that they have the anniversary of the uh, victory to see how important that is to Russian is people. Like and today is the night, absolutely. So um, of course you would, uh, but, but you have to also look at a man who did so much damage and broke so many families and devastated an entire society. The, the film now, the death of Stalin uh, is banned, of course, not surprisingly. You can't see it in Moscow uh, cinemas. Um, it's a great joke for the British. It's like the kind of cultural revolution in China, which is desperately serious for the Chinese. It seems to be a joke. You can go to cultural revolution shops in Shanghai and buy the cultural revolution artifacts. I have two of them in my office, uh, for example. I always get slightly embarrassed when Chinese students come in because I think it was not great for them. But they know nothing about the cultural revolution. <laughs> I have to tell them what it was, essentially. They've heard the term, but they don't know how many people actually perished uh, during that crazy 10-year period, the last years of Mao's life. So I think I'm agreeing with you, uh, except that this has been such a long answer, I can't remember what your question was. <laughs> so, <laughs> but hopefully, you know, if you've forgotten it, then makes both of us happy in this respect. Uh, I'll collect uh, a few questions uh, at, at once here, and if we can uh, try to keep your questions short so you can... Uh uh, remember them. Uh, in here's the the first gentleman right here, and then there's a woman over here, Karsten. Hello, sir. My name is Nedima Karevich. I'm ambassador of Bosnia and Herzegovina to Norway and Iceland. Two questions for you. Question number one. Um, I remember in year 2005, huge military parade in, in Moscow uh, where you could see for hours and hours armed vehicles and all kinds of weaponries. Uh, I was, that time, uh, although I don't have a military background, surprised that no one, no one seriously, uh, pointed the, this threat out in 2005. There were no reaction on it. My first question is why? Because I don't believe West can be so blind. And B, uh, I'm also witness, since I've been ambassador to Pakistan and Afghanistan before this posting, how dangerous the whole scope of the uh, uh, momentum, uh, pro-Putin momentum in Islamic world is, especially in Islamic world. So we witness since 9-11 uh, Islamophobia in the West world, just or unjust. I don't go into it, but it's Islamophobia. Uh, is it not uh, naive politics of the West to push the Muslim world to such extent to deliver allies to Putin on the table? Because this is happening in Pakistan. As a, all ex-Soviet republics of Soviet Union, instead to be against it, they are pro. I can sign it because I saw it uh, in the end last time, uh, Turkey. Thank you very much. And then there's a, a woman. Uh, Hi, my name is Stephanie Bureau. Um, I'd like to comment on what you said about uh, the uh, contempt that Russians have for the West. Uh, and I would just like to uh, say uh, a few things that you didn't mention. Uh, I mean, Russian elite, they also like to travel to the West. They like to live in the West. They settle down in the West. They use our institutions. They use our banks. They send their children to school. A lot of their children are, are citizens of uh, Western countries. 
Um, and the European Union remains uh, the largest trading partner of Russia. So uh, I'm wondering if, uh, if that uh, perhaps could nuance the picture a little bit. Thank you. Uh, well, let me just take up that question first. You're absolutely right. Uh, perhaps I didn't make it. I said what I meant to say was the contempt that Putin has for the West, not what the Russian people have for the West. But then I also added that when I talk about Russia, I now have to talk about Putin. The two, they're synonymous now in his own mind, and basically like all regimes who think that they actually represent the country that they claim to, uh, uh, to be ruling. So you're quite right about that. Uh, but it's a, it, in a sense, uh, as Zokov says in his article, you know, we're a half-breed nation. We think of ourselves as Europeans. European Russians think of ourselves as Europeans. But at the same time, we're clearly not European because we are not part of this kind of value system which the Europeans since the Enlightenment have been talking about, not always practicing, but have been talking about. So I think there's a kind of conflict in, in mind. But look, if you look at Russia territorially, it's now smaller than at any time since 1690. And two-thirds of Russians live in European Russia. Uh, the hemorrhaging from Siberia goes on endlessly, year after year. Young people do not want to live in Siberia. They go to European Russia. Putin has a struggle on his hands because the Slavophiles and some of the high nationalists want the civilizational states to be an ethnic Slavic state. And Putin, to his credit, is always saying in his speeches, the Slavs just constitute one part of Russia. And this brings us to the Muslim element, which is the fastest growing uh, population. It's a multicultural society, he says, a multi-ethnic society, a multiracial society. That is the reality of the civilizational state Russia is. And the support for the Tatar genes, by the way, the historians who write about that, are celebrating the Tatar period. Uh, Pushkin famously said, the Arabs brought algebra and Aristotle to Spain. The Tatars brought nothing. Well, that's not the new history that's being written. The Tatars are painted in a very good light. Uh, so the historians are fighting these battles. It's a historical battle that is going on between the Europeanist historians who basically say we're European and always have been, and those who say, no, no, we're actually both Asian and European, and that makes us unique. There's no other country that can claim that, okay? But I think we're agreeing on, on your main points. Now, to go to your point, um, uh, the civilizational state is a state which by definition has nothing to say to the rest of the world. Uh, no model to export, uh, no agenda, uh, no attempt to make the world safe for democracy, or in this case, to make the world safe for autocracy. Uh, Xi Jinping gets up, he speaks for China. We, we're not an example to you, because you can't be Chinese. The Chinese model is only for the Chinese. Uh, we've been around for 5,000 years. We're the oldest surviving civilization. Uh, that uh, may inspire you, but you dig into your own cultural capital if you want to be great. Be yourself. Don't be what the West wants you to be, basically. So that's the message, and I think it's a very inspiring message for much of the non-Western world that has been fed up of being patronized uh, for good or ill, usually for ill, by Western governments who think that they speak for history, the end of history. <laughs> we are the end of history. <laughs> it's rewarding and refreshing for them to have this pushback. And what we're seeing now is what a Western diplomat called it, pushback. They're pushing back, and they're pushing, going to push back with a vengeance now because they have the West on the run. And the United States doesn't know that. Nobody in the Trump administration is, is willing to even acknowledge this. They're, they're, they're picking fights with China about the rules-based international order. Well, of course the Chinese are going to have some say in reorganizing the world order. They will want their own input. It is bound to happen. You have to adjust and start adapting now. Finally, if you believe in your own values, you should do a little bit more in defending them at home rather than trying to export them abroad. Uh, we're fighting all sorts of battles against all sorts of enemies in my own institution, against political correctness, against a selective forgetting of history, against uh, no platforming of speakers. You know, the British government is now fighting back on that. It's introducing new legislation to force universities 
to allow people to come in of all different shapes and sizes and give lectures so that students can make their own minds up uh, as to the, the, value, the, you know, the, the, the value of what they hear. So I'm not surprised that Asian countries, Muslim countries, particularly Muslim countries who see the war on terror as a kind of Islamophobic agenda, are finding in Russia a, a man who stands up against the West. He's willing to pay the price in suffering. So it's not just speeches. He's calling upon the Russian people to accept uh, that they're, they're going to have to pay for the privilege of being Russian and not being what the West wants them to be. Uh, as for your first question, um, you know, we, uh, Russia became on the radar screen uh, an enemy, in quotes, in 2007 with the attack on Estonia. Uh, so this is the only country that uh, had to switch the internet off for a week. Uh, this was the only country I know of where people went to the ATM machines on Monday morning and couldn't get their money out of banks. Uh, still to this day, I mean, we go back to your point, we can't actually prove that Russia had the cyber attack on Estonia because it was routed through 65 different countries and computers. But everyone knows it was. But again, in a court of law, if I ex have a smart lawyer uh, and can pay for a smart lawyer, I can probably get off. Then there was the attack on Georgia. Uh, that followed the year uh, after. And that's it. But he told us that when he went to Munich. He actually said, it's begun. Uh, no, he said, I tried to be nice to you. You haven't been nice to me. So now we're back to where we were in the Cold War, uh, essentially. And, um, and as I say, Putin, if he were here, would uh, spin a different story than the one I've told, uh, in which Russia is the abused uh, party in all of this. So... There we are. We have uh, time for a l one last round of questions. Uh, first, Karsten in the front. Thank you. Um, I, I was curious about the, the Putin regime uh, and, and its survival, as it were. Uh, it seems to me that it depends so much on him as an individual. So let's say if he was to go tomorrow, uh, get killed or something, that this house of cards would completely collapse. So. Uh, we kind of <laughs> could you can could you speculate a little bit about what what could be the scenarios in case it, it, this this you know he disappeared overnight so to speak and a, a second question which is completely different but I, I would like still since we have you here as an expert on international security politics your quick comment on on last on the news from last night with with Trump U S pulling out of the of the of the Iran nuclear deal what the, what the consequences for for global security thank you there was a, a woman here in the center of the room. Thanks so much for your inspiring talk. I was just wondering, uh, what do you think are the chances uh, of uh, Russia spreading the idea of the Russian world in the neighboring countries? Or to make it more simple, what do you think, are th is there any hope for Ukraine in this situation? Thank you. And may I, one more? Uh, the gentleman right uh, next to you, if you had, if you had yeah, this guy. Uh, thank you. Um, one quick question on on the thing, is it possible to learn from history? But I should make it uh, very, very quick. Uh, we in the West play with the idea that we can learn something from history. Now, I'm somewhat doubtful if the, 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 if the Russians are playing the same game, but I'm sure they had drawn their conclusion from, say, the First World War and, and, and the Second World War. But if, do you think that they somehow are drawing conclusions from uh, the First Cold War? Uh, and say, here we did a stupid thing, we shouldn't do this next time. I'm thinking about the most stupid thing they did in the first Cold War was, of course, introducing the SS-20 uh, against the Americans and the Europeans. They lost that battle, of course. Uh, but again, if the Russians are looking at the first uh, Cold War, do you think, where could they possibly learn something? Yeah, okay. Good luck for that one. Eh? Thank you. Okay, I, I, I had to remember them. So I was going to take the second question first, uh, which was your question, which I've forgotten. On Ukraine? Oh, yes. Any help? Uh, no. Um, <laughs> uh, the Russians have uh, invented a wonderful concept from their point of view called frozen conflicts. The West likes solving <laughs> conflicts. And sometimes we make very big mistakes. And some conflicts are beyond resolution. Uh, like the Irish question in the 19th century. You know, 
the wonderful English joke that whenever the English came up with the answer to the Irish question, the Irish always changed the question. Uh, some people like conflicts. Uh, many people have invested a lot of money in those conflicts. Their power base comes from conflicts. They don't want solutions. But generally, Western countries believe they're in the business of resolving regional disputes forever. And Russia is not. Russia switches them on and off when it is convenient, whether they're in the Caucasus or now whether they're in the Ukraine, because it's power. But it's the power of the weak, not the power of the strong. Uh, and it plays to the strengths of their own weakness, uh, basically. So they've got us on the run. And now you have, of course, a Ukrainian president who's on the telephone to Putin. They're buddies. They're businessmen, both of them. This guy's made about two billion since he's been in office, the Ukrainian president. They talk about business, business deals. They don't talk about Ukrainian politics. It's a wonderful relationship, isn't it? I wish Theresa May had that relationship with Vladimir Putin. And then uh, we'd all be perhaps in a different world. So uh, the first question, I'm going to keep it to the end because they're difficult ones. The, uh, your question, well, it is difficult. <laughs> Do we learn anything from history? The answer is yes. We, we learn that we learn nothing from history. And we repeat the same mistakes over and over and over again. Uh, the first Cold War, what was the mistake the Russians made? Um, they made the mistake of believing their own propaganda. So when you're lying, you should always know that you're lying. You should always overhear yourself lying. Which reminds me of the first Oscar Wilde joke. Uh, when he was at Oxford as a student, he was talking in the back row to a friend during the lecture by a very eminent Oxford don called Walter Pater. And Pater got so annoyed, he stopped his lecture and said, young man, yes, you, sir, can you hear what I'm saying? And he said, I'm afraid, sir, we can overhear you. <laughs> so we... we Sometimes we overhear ourselves speaking to others and know that we're lying, and, and that's fine because that's called diplomacy, and you know that you're lying, and you're paid to lie. Uh, so everyone is happy in a sense. Um, what did the Russians think? Do you remember when Khrushchev uh, came to Washington in 1959 uh, with this notorious, uh, we will bury you, which people, of course, wrongly think he was talking about missiles. No, he was talking about refrigerators. He'd been told by his economists by 1970 the Soviet Union would be as strong as the United States. By 1980, it would have double the GNP. He seriously believed that. Uh, by 1980, no one in the Soviet Union believed that. It was about survival. How can the regime survive? How can we keep this show on the road for as long as possible? So, um, you know, there's that wonderful joke. Sorry about the jokes, but I'm English. The wonderful joke, it's a Russian joke, about the train called the Soviet Union that starts off in 1917, and uh, it doesn't move, <laughs> it doesn't leave the platform. And they all look at Lenin reproachfully. It's your train, you designed this. So Stalin says, I'll get this train moving, and he goes away. They hear a shot in the distance. He comes back, he says, I've just shot the engine driver. That will get the train moving. Of course, it doesn't. So Khrushchev goes away and says, I've just rehabilitated the engine driver. That will get this train moving. And of course, it doesn't. And Brezhnev says, why don't we just draw the curtains and pretend it's moving? And then when Gorbachev came to power, they added a Gorbachev uh, aspect to this joke. Gorbachev is a person who believes in the train. And so he says, I'm going to find why this train isn't moving. And he opens the window and says, my god, there aren't any tracks underneath it. <laughs> Gorbachev destroyed the Soviet Union because he believed in communism and he believed it was reformable. His predecessors didn't. Uh, the cynicism would have kept the show on the road for another 20 or 30 years, I suspect. The belief didn't. And what the Chinese have learned from that, the Russians have learned from that, Putin has learned from that. So the, the first thing is be very cynical. And Putin is the most cynical person on the planet. Perhaps that I'm, I'm maligning him, but he's obviously and openly cynical in the way that Westerners are much more hypocritical about it and have fine speeches and phrases to hide their own self-interest. So is that the uh, kind of answer to your, your question? I hope we do learn something from history. Uh, but, but remember, we told ourselves the same story. I mean, this was the important thing. The reason why the situation is more dangerous today than it was in the Cold War is that we told ourselves a story that we believed that the Soviet Union would collapse eventually from its internal contradictions. And all we had to do was to stop a nuclear war, because we didn't want, obviously, a nuclear war. And the Russians told themselves exactly the same story. The West would collapse from its internal contradictions. When you have two enemies 
telling themselves the same story, but at different versions, you have stability. Putin's stories and our stories are very, very different. And we talk past each other. We don't talk to each other. So Putin is genuine about uh, Western decadence. He actually thinks that we're, we're finished. The Chinese probably think the same, but they're coming it from a different perspective. Um, and what do we tell ourselves about Putin's Russia, which comes now to your question? Uh, I haven't a clue. And, and that's the problem when you have a one-man system like this. He doesn't have children to whom he can pass. So uh, we are told by experts that he desperately is, he's desperately tired. He would love to go, but he can't. He's imprisoned in his own system. There's no one to do a deal with. You know, Yeltsin got immunity from prosecution for his family. That was the, the price uh, for P having Putin in the presidency. There is no such figure. He's it. He's everything. I suppose he could go to Switzerland uh, and retire there. But he wouldn't feel safe. Uh, none of these people. You know, Zuma didn't want to go. Mugabe didn't want to go. Uh, they all can't go. It's not because they want to cling to power. They can't afford to step down. They've created a system. They're tyrannized by the tyranny they themselves have created. It's one of the paradoxes. Thucydides would have loved it, because discussion of paradoxes and irony. So um, I, uh, I don't know. And, and we, we do know that it could be worse. It could be much worse. We believe he doesn't actually believe most of what he says. But there are people around him who do. And they're the nationalists looking for a fight, probably. And Putin's reached the age where he doesn't want war. He doesn't want to sacrifice this. Uh, I don't think anybody wants war in the world at the moment, even Kim in North Korea, quite frankly. So we're perhaps in a, a safer period. Now that brings me to your last question. Iran, yes, well, it's, I see that what we're going to try to do is keep the treaty without the United States. So basically, just say America's out of it, but the treaty still holds. We still have the review commissions. We still have the inspectors, and we will continue it. Who cares about Trump? And that, I think, is actually quite a, an intelligent and adult way of dealing with it. I mean, Trump is dealing himself out of Middle East politics by some of the decisions he's taken. Uh, and his relationship with Saudi Arabia is extremely dangerous because this young guy in Saudi Arabia is reckless and I think doesn't fully understand uh, the realities of international politics and Netanyahu is playing his own game uh, because it makes him, uh, un, 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 uh, it makes uh, basically Netanyahu there forever because who else can play that game? So I think that's what we'll have to, uh, have to accept. And of course, if you're Kim and you're about to meet Mr. Trump, I mean, what's the value of, of, of a treaty or anything that you sign with the United States if one person, for purely perverse reasons, can undo it? <coughs> so it's madness. Uh, so there we are. That's the answer to the question. It's so what Theresa May would say, but she wouldn't use the word madness, of course. You know. We understand his reasons. But. And uh, with that, I think we will uh, conclude our presentation today. Uh, Professor Coker, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.